I want to introduce again where we are here in 1 Timothy. Remember last time in 1 Timothy, we were in that section where Paul had told us that Christ could come back at any time, and therefore it behooved that we would live godly lives. And we learned that God was in control sovereignly over the timing of Christ's return. Now, as we proceed this week into 1 Timothy, we're going to see that Paul is going to describe further the nature of God's sovereign power. And so we're going to be looking at one of the incommunicable attributes of God, that is the aseity of God. The term aseity is a fancy word that has to do with God being self-sufficient and non-contingent so that he does not rely on anything or anyone outside of himself in order for his own existence or sustainability. And what you're going to learn today is that God's eternal nature is absolutely essential for the existence of all things. We're going to prove that without God, we'd have nothing now. It's also essential for morality. And as I'm going to show you, even for our everlasting life as believers, we're dependent upon the aseity of God. So with that, let's begin where we left off last time, 1 Timothy 6.15. Remember, the beginning part of that verse, Paul said that God the Father is sovereignly in control of the coming of Jesus a second time. So he says, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now notice here the relative pronoun that you see in the box on the screen, the which, that's referring back to verse 14 and the appearing of Christ. So the idea then is this has to do with Christ's second coming. The beginning part of verse 15, Paul is saying that God is sovereign and in charge of when Jesus Christ returns. It will happen at the proper time. That's where we left off last time. Now, after that, notice after the dash, Paul begins extolling the greatness of God and giving him praise. Notice he says, he who is the blessed. Now, what does it mean that God is blessed? I want to begin by talking about what it means for humans to be blessed, and then I want to relate that term to God. Now, when we talk about this blessing upon human beings, Oftentimes, when you talk to scholars or you read what they write, you will see that they will say that blessed simply means to be happy. And I don't like that definition. Let me explain the definition that I would have. To be blessed as a believer means you're not cursed. And I know as you're sitting there, you're thinking, well, that's not very helpful, but let me fill that in. If you are blessed in both the Old and the New Testament, it means you are no longer under the curse of God. It's positional. It's a status. Meaning that because you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, because you have the forgiveness of sins, you're no longer under the wrath of God. And therefore, you are now a partaker in the promises of God, including resurrection and a glorious new kingdom. And I say that because I want you to think about a Christian who may be suffering in some gulag, God forbid, and being tortured. Certainly, they're not going to have a big happy face you know, on their as an expression, it'll give me more torture. But I want you to know that they're still blessed and they're not cursed. Even if they die in that torture chamber, they're blessed. Why? Because they're no longer under the wrath of God and they one day will have everlasting life and they will have a partaking in the glorious kingdom. Now, what does it mean that God is the blessed? Well, think about God is transcendent. He is high and apart, in a sense, from His creation. A creation that He created good but that because of sin has fallen into corruption. But because God is apart from that, he is always blessed. He is content and in bliss in his own essence. He's not dependent on anything on the outside of himself in creation for his own blessed status. But he's also, I think, called the blessed because he's worthy of all praise. Since God is the source of all blessings that flow to his people, whether it's forgiveness of sins, whether it's the resurrection or the coming glorious kingdom. So the blessed nature of God is who he is, but it's also what he bestows upon us. Now next, notice here Paul says that he's also the only sovereign. Notice the only there, monos, meaning one. There's only one sovereign, and it's no potentate or king of the earth. It's the Holy One of Israel. The idea here of sovereign, the root term really comes from a term in Greek that has to do with power. And I only mention that because ultimately the reason why God is all sovereign is because he has all power. He can subdue any king or army that will ever come against him. 
And so that's why Paul, right after that, he doubles down in a sense, and he says he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And I love that expression. Do you realize that that same expression is applied here, yes, to the Father, but also to the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 17, 14? Now, why is that important? Well, someday you're probably going to have a Jehovah Witness that comes to the door, and they will say to you, I don't believe that Jesus is God. Well, here, if God the Father is linked to being the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, I think it's fair to infer that Jesus is equal to God. He is, in fact, God himself. Now, the fact that God is the King of kings and the Lord of lords means that there's no higher authority that can be appealed to. You can't appeal to some mayor, governor, president, king, a UN council meeting, the Supreme Court. There's no higher authority in the cosmos other than God. And so, in fact, all of morality is defined by what God says. You can't appeal to anyone else. In fact, remember Dostoevsky, the famous Russian writer, said that without God, all things are permissible. You see, without God and his eternal nature, morality is impossible to have. Wouldn't it be somewhat ridiculous to say that if a human being is nothing more than a cosmic accident, that it's wrong for one human cosmic accident to go kill another human cosmic accident? Well, of course that would be absurd. Us saying that that's wrong would be just mere arbitrary without the existence of an eternal God that governs morality. Now, notice here God's rule is seen then in two realms. God's rule is seen in the unseen realm that Bob has been talking about in the divine council and the angelic realm. But he also has a rule that extends to the seen realm, that is the earth. And one day you and I are going to feel the full weight of that kingdom come to earth as it is in heaven. Remember Jesus when he taught his disciples how to pray? He said in Matthew 6.10, remember he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. One day God's rule and his kingship will be acknowledged by all. And so it behooves every person then to bow their knee now to the lordship of God, to the lordship of Christ. In fact, it says in Philippians 2, 10 through 11, one day every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So here's the two options. You either bow your knee now and you have forgiveness of sins and everlasting life, or after Christ returns, you will bow your knee but instead you'll have condemnation and eternal condemnation and damnation. That's what you get. So it's either or. You're going to bow your knee either now or it's going to be later, but everyone will acknowledge the kingship of the Holy One of Israel. Now here Paul begins to stress the eternality, the aseity of God. In verse 16a, he says, Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light? Now, notice in the box that phrase, who alone. What that shows is that it denotes the idea that, yes, whatever is going to be said applies to only God. And I say that because Bob did a wonderful job last week in Ephesians talking about what we refer to as the communicable attributes of God. A communicable attribute of God is an attribute that God shares with us. So last week we focused on the fact that God is gracious and therefore you and I are called to be gracious. Now, certainly he's perfect in his graciousness, and you and I aren't, but we're still called to be gracious. He is perfectly loving. We can be loving. These are examples of communicable attributes that God shares with us. But when Paul puts who alone, referring to God, he's tipping us off that this is an incommunicable attribute that God alone has. Now, when we define the incommunicable attributes of God, oftentimes they begin with an omni. For example, God is omnipresent. We are not. We are fixed to this locale. Right now we're in St. Louis Park. God isn't limited in that way. God is omniscient. He knows all things. We don't. We're rational, but we're not omniscient. God is omnipotent. He has all power. But when you start looking at all of God's incommunicable attributes, they are all really rooted in his aseity. And that's what Paul is really stressing here where he says, who alone possesses 
immortality. Again, the aseity of God, the idea that he alone possesses immortality, means he is a self-sustaining being, a non-contingent being. He is not dependent upon anything or anyone outside of himself, either for his existence or his own sustainability. How many in here plan on getting a bite to eat later on today? I know I can't go a few hours without tucking a tuna sandwich in the mouth or something to eat. I had a protein drink before I got up here. I'd probably be too peaked to finish. The whole point is, is that we as human beings need constant inflow of energy in order to survive. We are contingent. God is not. He is the non-contingent creator of all things. So part and parcel to a biblical worldview is that you have a non-contingent creator who created all things, and everything else in the creation is contingent. That's what you and I have to know. That's the world and the cosmos as it really is. Now, let me give you a Latin phrase. I'm going to talk more about this idea of God's eternality and the significance of it. There's a famous Latin phrase, ex nihilo, nihil fit. And the English version of that is, out of nothing, nothing comes. Now, that's very important. What that means is if there was ever a time that you would have nothing, you'd have nothing now. So something has to be eternal for there to be the existence of anything now. What the Bible is describing is that is God. And lo and behold, when we look at the root of God's self-disclosure to humankind, he reveals himself as an eternal being. That's how he reveals himself, for example, to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Do you remember in Exodus chapter 3, Moses is on Sinai prior to the Exodus. And he's going to be sent to the Israelites. And so he asked the question, who should I say that sent me to the Israelites? And listen to God's response. Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, here's who you say is sending you. He said, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Of course, Jesus refers to himself, remember in John 8.58, is I am. What does I am mean? It's a verb of being. This is Yahweh's covenant name. It comes more than likely from a yiktol verb, a verb of being. I will be who I will be, or I am who I am. And so the root of God's self-disclosure to Moses and to the Israelites and to all of humanity is focusing on the fact that he's an eternal, non-contingent being. He always is. He's therefore the root of everything that exists. He's the grounding for it all. Okay, now we're going to come more to that in our application. But notice now, if Paul is here describing the immortality of God's existence, now he begins to describe the glory of God's habitation. Notice he says he dwells in unapproachable light. The term unapproachable, by the way, is what we call a hapax legomena. It only occurs once in our New Testament. Now, what does it mean that God dwells in unapproachable light? On the one hand, I have to say to you firmly, I don't know. I don't know what the metaphysics of that is. But what I can tell you is some of the significance of it. So, for example, when Moses meets God up on Mount Sinai, the historical fact that really changed all of Israel's history and the world's history, remember he sees God as light in the theophany. So much so that when Moses comes down from the mountain, his face still shines with the glory. Think about in Exodus chapter 27 when God commands the Israelites to build their tabernacle, which later becomes the temple. In that tabernacle, they're to have a lamp that burns continuously in light. Why? Because what is on earth is to symbolize the greater reality in heaven, that God is an eternal, unapproachable light. Think about in 1 John 1, 5. The apostle John says that God is light and in him... There is no darkness at all. So I can't tell you the metaphysics and how God dwells. But what I can tell you is that the point of him dwelling in light revealed to us accentuates two things. Number one, he's transcendent, meaning that God is apart from his creation. Now, he's imminent. He's with us as well. But we learn from this that he's transcendent, not relying or dependent upon anything in his creation. But we also learn something of his holiness. 
that he's pure without spot, and he's set apart from everything else in creation. Now, the reason I want to talk about God's transcendence a little bit is I believe the transcendence of God is under attack within the church today, within evangelicalism that's getting more into Eastern thought. Let me give you an example of this. How many in here have ever listened to a song in a Christian radio station, and when you listen to the worship song, you cannot tell whether the Christian songwriter is talking about his girlfriend or God? Have you heard that? It bothers me so bad. I just turn it to a secular station. I, I, I might as well just listen to someone sing about their girlfriend rather than that confusion. That's how bad it bothers me. Let me give you a, a concrete example. How many in here have ever heard, seen, I think it's a commercial on TV, eHarmony.com? It's a Christian dating site. In the song that eHarmony.com plays is all I want to do. I, I won't sing it because that would be the abomination that causes desolation. <laughs> But it's all I want to do is be with you. And this man is actually singing, or no, I'm sorry, it's all I want to do is fall in love with you. That's how it goes. And this man is singing about wanting to fall in love with God. But it sounds like he wants to fall in love with his wife or his girlfriend. And so, so much so that eHarmony.com uses it for a message about dating. How did this happen? That God is spoken of as our girlfriend or boyfriend or Ed next door, the neighbor, but he's no longer seen as transcendent. Well, it happened because of Eastern thought coming into the evangelical church. Because in Eastern thought, whether it's Hinduism or Buddhism, you don't have theism, God transcended from the creation, you have the creator in the creation. And what's more, think about the New Age movement, where every single human being is divine in and of themselves. So God has lost his unique transcendence. So here's something I want you to remember. As you're building your theology and your knowledge about God, remember that he's both transcendent, far apart and above his creation, not dependent upon it, but he's also imminent. That means he's with us. The Bible does not teach a deistic God who simply, like a clockmaker, wound the, the world up and then let it go. No, he's also imminent. So anytime you lose imminence or transcendence, you're unbalanced. And there's a great quote from Isaiah, a phrase that he uses 25 times in his book that I think is a helpful remember to keep both the transcendence and the imminence of God together. And that's the phrase, the Holy One of Israel. That's one of my favorite descriptions of God because in it you see God's transcendence. He's holy. He's set apart. There's none like him. He's different than everything else in creation, but he's the Holy One of Israel. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. He's planted his flag. He sent his son. He's going to bring an earthly kingdom. His people shall reign upon the earth. He is the God who hasn't left us. So he's both transcendent and imminent. And today, Paul is stressing the transcendence, the aseity of God. Now, as we continue on, Paul's going to be further talking about the description of God, but also showing us what the proper response of man should be. Notice Paul says in verse 16b, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Now, I want you to see that in this underline where he says no man has seen him or can see him. What this means is that no person has or can see God in his essence. No one has seen him as he truly is. Now, in our applications, I'm going to show you that one day when we're in our glorified state, I believe we will see God as he is. But as it is now and in the past, no one can or see, has seen God, for if they had, they would have died. In fact, that's exactly what God revealed to Moses. Remember in Exodus 33, Moses is up on Mount Sinai, and he asked God, reveal yourself to me. And notice God's response. This is Exodus 33, I'll read verse 20 first. But he said, this is God, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. Now when God says you cannot see my face, what he's saying is you can't see me in my essence, who I truly am. And that's, why, that's one of the reasons I think Paul refers to him as one who dwells in unapproachable light. He cannot be seen 
by a mere mortal. But notice this phrase in the underline, no man can see me and live. That's exactly what Paul is saying. Now, notice in verse 21, what does God do for Moses so that he can experience something of who God is in this theophany on Sinai? Notice it says, then the Lord said, and by the way, stop there for a moment. Notice the Lord, all caps, that's Yahweh. That's I am. That's his covenant name, again, having to do with his eternality. So then Yahweh said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you shall stand there on the rock. So what God does with Moses is he places him in the cleft of the rock. It's a mediated experience when Moses sees the theophany of God. And Moses is allowed not to see God in his entirety or in his essence, but like the glory caboose, he is seeing something of the true God. But no man can truly see him and live. All right, now, notice here after that then, Paul begins to ascribe honor and praise to God. He says, to him be honor and eternal dominion. I want to begin with the eternal dominion first. Here Paul is ascribing to God what is certainly true. But it's, not, it's more than just a well-wish. He's describing it, but he's also blessing God. Now, what does it mean that God has eternal dominion? Well, for those of you that may be new to the Bible, here's the way this is going to work. In history, the next event on God's redemptive calendar is that he's going to send his son, who's bodily raised and seated at the right hand of God, he's going to send his son to earth, and he's going to establish a kingdom from Jerusalem. The kingdom will be established, the headquarters will be in Jerusalem, and Jesus will reign there for a thousand years. And during that time, there will be no more war. This is what Isaiah prophesied 700 years prior to Christ's first coming. Isaiah 2.4, that one day the swords will be beat into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks, and the nations shall no longer learn war. In Zechariah 14, we see it promised some 500 years prior to the coming of Christ the first time that one day all the nations are going to flow to Jerusalem and they're going to honor the great king. That's the next event in God's redemptive calendar. He will bring that kingdom. But after that, a thousand-year kingdom, then God recreates new heavens, new earth, new Jerusalem. And that will be the stomping grounds for every believer. And so he really does have an eternal dominion, even though human beings now may not be experiencing it. It is, in fact, true. So notice then we are to honor God. That's something Paul wants. He deserves all honor. What does it mean to honor God? It means that he deserves the first place in everything. He deserves the weightiness that is due him. When there's a choice to either gratify your own desires or to honor God, when sometimes those are different things, we are to honor God. He's worthy of all honor. Now, how can we as believers honor God? Well, one of the ways that we can do that is to realize that God is the grounds for all existence, that he really is the eternal creator, and he is the source for all things, all morality, and even our everlasting life. Now, I think we also have to honor... Whoops, I heard some buzzing there. I'll stand back here. I think we also have to remember to worship and honor the creator rather than the creation. Remember what Paul said in Romans 1.25, when people are pagans, they worship and honor the creation rather than the creator. And that's what we're seeing in spades today in our culture. Why? Well, because of the idea that God is in creation. The creation is being elevated rather than the creator. Brothers and sisters, you and I have to be different. We have to be those who live to honor God, the creator, rather than the creation. Okay, now, let me come to three application points that I have for you here this morning. Number one, we should know that God's eternality is necessary for the existence of all things. What I'm going to show you is that God is the uncaused causer. Without his eternality, you would have nothing now because nothing can't do something. Number two, we should realize that everlasting life belongs to believers because of God's life-giving power. In other words, when you and I are given our resurrected bodies, our immortality is dependent upon him who alone dwells in immortality, who alone possesses immortality. Third thing, only believers in Christ will see God. 
Remember, Paul says, no one has seen him or can see him. That one day is going to be reversed in our glorified state. It's a great promise. Let's look at them. First of all, number one, I want to help everyone in here build a biblical worldview, especially when it comes to the idea of existence. So what I want to do is I want to, first of all, give you the varying views on existence. I have three of them. Now, I know there's some people who have more categories, but, I'm, for example, I'm not going to use deism. Deism is a God who creates all things but then just lets it go. But I'm not interested in about the sustaining of the universe here. I'm just talking about its initial existence. So here's, to me, the three basic views. There's the Eastern view of existence. This is a panentheism or pantheism view, that the creator is in the creation. In this view, there's no distinction between the creator and the creation. All right, now, second view, atheistic worldview is that there's an eternal universe. In this view, there is no creator. There's only the creation. As Carl Sagan's, remember he famously said, the universe is all there ever was, all there ever is, and all there ever will be. Right? That was his famous line. He said that, that was all there was was the creation. He didn't call it the creation, but it was the universe. The third view is the theistic worldview. And there you have a distinction between the creator and the creation. So let me pull up my pointer, go through these one more time. Eastern worldview, creator is the creation. Atheistic worldview, there's no creator, there's only the creation. Theistic worldview, we have a distinction between an eternal creator, non-contingent, and a creation that's completely contingent. That's the big difference. And so that's what we see, for example, revealed in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, notice in that statement, there's two things that the Bible does not say. The Bible does not say that God self-created himself. That would be an absurdity. That would be a fairy tale. That would be a violation of the law of non-contradiction. After all, how could God not exist and at the same time exist to put himself into existence? But the Bible doesn't ask us to believe that absurdity. It asks us to believe that he's always been, that he's eternal. Notice the second thing that the Bible doesn't teach in Genesis 1.1 is that God came from eternal matter. By the way, when Moses penned this, whenever he did pen it in the 1400s B.C., remember the prevailing worldview was the, of the Babylonians. They believed that their gods proceeded from matter that had prior, existed prior, more than likely from eternity. So they believed in eternal matter. So here's what I want you to think about. When we think about the Eastern worldview and the atheistic worldview, both of them are caught in a quandary. And the quandary is this. Either they're going to have to deny the law of non-contradiction. They'd have to say that nothing can do something. Or they're going to have to violate the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Now, let me reveal this more closely so you'll understand exactly how this works. I'm going to share with you something called a cosmological argument. By the way, this cosmological argument came from a man named R.C. Sproul. One of my favorite books that he ever wrote was a book called Not a Chance. In that book, I used to share it with a lot of airline pilots and flight attendants that I would fly with. And so I'm going to be using his cosmological argument. And I'm doing that because you can use this with your friends, neighbors, relatives to prove the existence of God. Now, when it comes to the existence of the universe and all things, it boils down to four possibilities. And any scenario that you will ever come up with will fall within one of these four. And I'll show you that. First possibility for the existence of all things is that it really doesn't exist. It's just an illusion. Me speaking to you here today, you eating donuts, the Vikings losing, that would be a nice illusion, but it's all fake. Do you know that there was a famous French philosopher who dealt with that very issue, René Descartes? 17th century French philosopher, he wanted to have something that he knew for sure that he could stand on and, and know other things. So what Rene Descartes did is he went on a process by which he started to doubting everything. He doubted his own existence. He doubted his family's existence. He doubted, doubted, doubted. But as he doubted, he realized he was doing something. Doubting is thinking. 
And because he was thinking, he knew that he was doing something, and he knew nothing can't do something. And hence you have the famous, I think, therefore I am. So if you doubt that everything exists, realize you're doing something and nothing can't do something, therefore you've proven existence. So we can rule out, number one, everything is not just an illusion, there really is existence. Number two, the universe self-created itself. This is an absurdity. Why? Because you have a violation of the law of non-contradiction. If A, then not non-A at the same time and in the same relationship. How could the universe not exist and at the same time exist to put itself into existence? That's absurd. And whenever you come to an absurdity, you have to say, well, we got to go back to the drawing board. We have to rethink this issue. Now, I've, I've dealt with some people in debate where they'll say, well, I don't really believe that the law of non-contradiction exists. You know what I like to respond? I like to say, oh, you're saying it does exist. And they start to become more adamant. No, it doesn't exist. Now, so you're saying it does exist. And what I'm trying to drive them to is the idea that it can't not exist and exist at the same time. They're having to use the law of non-contradiction to get rid of it. Isn't that ironic? The famous apologist Norman Geisler said, anytime you have to use what you're trying to deny exists, you don't have a very good case. Dear ones, you can't get around the law of non-contradiction. You can't get around it. God created that law. Okay, let's go to the third option. The universe is eternal. Now, this isn't absurd, but I do believe it's unscientific. And that's because of the second law of thermodynamics. How many of you here remember some of your physics that you took maybe in college or in high school? Remember the first law of thermodynamics is the law of conservation of mass and energy. You have a total amount that cannot be destroyed or created. You're with a fixed amount, and that says very little about the beginning of the universe, other than that it's stable in that sense. But the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, is devastating against an eternal universe. Why? Because the second law says all energy in a closed system is going, going from a higher organized state to a lesser organized state, meaning that one day the sun and the stars will burn out. You only have so much usable energy. The total amount is always the same, but it's becoming less and less usable. So how can you have an infinite lifespan of a universe with a finite supply of usable energy? Dear ones, if the universe was eternal, we'd be out of usable energy right now. I wouldn't be speaking to you. I would be very hungry. There'd be no food. There'd be no light, no stars. So therefore, the universe cannot be eternal. So we're left with a fourth option. The fourth option is there's an eternal being outside of the universe who created all things. That's exactly what Paul was revealing to us today when he said God alone possesses immortality. That is not a violation of the law of non-contradiction, and it's not a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. There must be a creator who created all things, the eternal one, and that's what we see revealed in the scriptures. By the way, there was a famous agnostic named Robert Jastrow. Robert Jastrow, for those of you who don't know him, in 1961, he was the one who established NASA's Goddard Space Institute. And he was an agnostic. But what he learned that the universe could not be eternal, he started to really question his own agnosticism. I want to give you a quote from him. This is from Robert Jastrow, physicist, astronomer, head of NASA's Goddard Space Institute. Listen to what he writes in his book, God and the Astronomers. He says this, quote, For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason... The story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries, unquote. Robert Jastrow realized the universe couldn't be eternal. Therefore, you had to have an eternal being outside of it. He knew that. Robert Jastrow, dear ones, he was really saying, in a secular sense, the same thing, that the psalmist said when he said, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Yes, the scriptures do declare that God is the creator, the non-contingent eternal being, the source of all things. 
Now, as we come to our next application point, I want to talk about three ramifications of God being eternal that we haven't talked about yet. And I'll kind of conclude with the idea that he gives us everlasting life at this point. But first of all, number one, I want you to think about every living thing has breath that comes from a God who's eternal, non-contingent, who can give them that breath. Now, don't turn to this, but just jot this down. Acts 17, 28. Do you remember there Paul says that in him, that's in God, we live, we move, and we have our being. I love that. Why does he say that? Because we're contingent, God is not. And by the way, as Paul said that, he was citing a secular philosopher named Epimenides from 600 B.C. He was from Crete. So this is something that even pagans knew that there was a God who was the creator and the source of all things. Now, I mention this because every single living thing owes their breath to God. And what that means to us is that we have to be those who are willing to say, Lord, I owe you all that I am. Even the breath in my lungs, even the intricate network within my body that fights disease, that fends off illnesses, everything that I am, comes from you. It's not an accident. It didn't come about by chance. By the way, chance has no being. It can't do anything. It's merely a word describing probability. It didn't come about by chance. It came about through the crater. And so that means, again, we have to honor him. We have to honor God with our lives. Why? We owe him our very breath. A second ramification of God being eternal is not only is he the creator of all things, but because he's self-sustaining, he can also sustain all things. In fact, I want you to turn your Bibles to Colossians 1, verses 16 through 17, and I'll show you this very point. Again, because God is non-contingent, he can sustain the entire universe. Colossians 1, 16 through 17. Notice in verse 16 here, by the way, this is extolling who Christ is. Second person of the Trinity, the creator, the Son. It says, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. Now notice verse 17. It says, He, that's Christ, is before all things, and in him all things hold together. The last part of verse 17 shows us that the eternality of God is necessary for what? The sustaining of all things. That there's not one random molecule anywhere in the universe. Now, why is that important? How many in here have ever seen one of those Hollywood movies where the meteor comes and destroys everything and you got people fighting it out and they're fighting for Twinkies and uh, just various sources of food because it's the cataclysmic end of all things? You and I don't have to buy into it. Why? Because Jesus controls it all. There's not one random molecule. He has it all ordained. How about global warming? How many children in a post-Christian culture are concerned about global warming. They're so concerned that some of them are suicidal. There's been studies done by these, about these kids being so depressed because they think the earth is going to end due to cataclysmic overheating. But dear brothers and sisters, God is in charge of it. He's in control. In fact, I want to share with you a passage. Bob had raised it to my attention from Genesis 8, and he's going to be coming to this Think about this in Genesis 8.22. You may want to turn there. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 8.22. We looked at this a few weeks ago with Bob in Sunday school. Genesis 8.22. This is what God said to Noah about the promises that the earth would never be destroyed again as he did with the flood. Notice it says in Genesis 8.22, he said, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. So notice the claim that as long as the world goes, it's not going to cease the seasons. You're going to have cold and you're going to have heat. It's not going to end. So here's the question. Are you going to believe the Holy One of Israel? Or are you going to believe Al Gore? <laughs> Al Gore, we weren't supposed to have snow. Mid children in the Midwest weren't going to see snow about 10 years ago. We've seen a lot of snow. I want you to think of the predictions that God made 
Has he erred in any of them? Micah 5, 2, the son is going to be born in Bethlehem. He was. Zechariah 11, 12, he's betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He was. Ezekiel 26, God predicted the destruction of Tyre 254 years in advance. He calls Cyrus by name 150 years in advance. God never errs in any of the predictions he made. But the global warming proponents have erred time and time again. Who are you going to trust? The Holy One of Israel, who is eternal, non-contingent, who never lies, who has never erred? Or the global warming proponents? Brothers and sisters, you and I should think differently. We know that God is the sustainer of all things. Now, let me come to another one, and that is because God is eternal, you and I have the source for eternal life as well. Our eternal life in our resurrected body is sustained by Him because He's the non-contingent being. And I want to share a passage with you that alludes to this. It infers this. Remember in Matthew 22, the Sadducees were debating with Jesus. And they were, I always like the joke, they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection, right? Well, remember the Sadducees also only believed in the first five books of Moses. They had a dim view of the rest of the Hebrew canon. So as they were debating with Jesus about everlasting life, and the nature of the resurrection, when Jesus refutes them, he doesn't appeal to Isaiah 26, which talks about the resurrection, or Daniel chapter 12. He appeals to a passage they would accept in Exodus 3. Listen to how he responds. Matthew 22, 31 through 32, Jesus responding to the Sadducees. He says, But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Verse 32, he says, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now stop there for just a moment. That's for Exodus 3, 6. Earlier you and I looked at Exodus 3, 14, where God reveals himself as I am. But here he's revealing himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a phrase that occurs time and time again throughout the Old Testament. God is regarded as the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. What's the point? Well, the point is that God is a life-giving God, and it would be very bad false advertising for God indeed if he were merely the God of three dead guys. Here's the God of Israel. He's the dead, or he's the, the God of three dead men. Yippee. Can I have a noisemaker? That's not real exciting, is it? But notice the conclusion that Jesus reaches, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Because God is non-contingent, self-sustaining, he always lives to sustain his people. And because you and I belong to him, because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob belong to him, we must live. Jesus appeals to the character of God and to the essential nature of God for the eternal life of God's people. Again, Paul said today in our passage, it's he alone who possesses immortality. Now, what's interesting, you're going to see that same phrase, immortality, crop up as Paul's discussing the nature of the resurrected body. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's distinguishing between the old body that's going to perish and the new resurrected body that will live forever. And he says something very interesting. Notice he says, For this perishable old body must put on the imperishable, that's the resurrected body, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Now, I want you to notice here in the text, Paul uses the term twice, immortality. That's the same term in Greek that was used in our passage in 1 Timothy 6.16, where it said that God alone possesses immortality. Well, if he alone possesses immortality, why is there a promise for us? Well, there's a promise for us because we have our sins forgiven and we belong to him by faith in Jesus Christ. The immortality that God alone possesses is a gift given to his people, and he always lives to sustain us unto eternity. 
You know, death is something that plagues everyone. It's a fearful thing. We've buried many of our friends and loved ones in this very building. We've been witnessing death throughout our whole lives. It's a fearsome thing to see. But God promises us that he's overcome it. And that's one of my favorite promises in all of the Bible. Notice in verse 55, he mocks death on our behalf. He says, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Do you ever think about if everything was just an accident and everything came about by chance, why not by chance? Why hasn't someone lived forever or something lived forever? You see, death itself is a design by a God who subjected the creation to futility and decay because of sin. But in his graciousness, in his power, he proclaims to his people that he will overcome it on our behalf. That's only possible because God is a non-contingent being. Now, the last thing I want to leave you with is the idea that only believers will see God. Remember, Paul had said earlier in 1 Timothy 6.16 that no one has seen him or can see him at any time. What I want to assert to you is that is true. No one has seen God or can see God now as he is. But there's a great promise that one day in our glorified state, we will see God. We will see him, but it's only for those who trust in Christ. Now, let me just remind you of a little bit of history. Remember on Mount Sinai, Moses saw something of God, but it was mediated. When Jesus comes, we're really seeing God in his glory, but even that's mediated. In fact, notice what John said in John 1.18. John says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So notice John is saying the same thing that, in fact, Paul said. Now, notice the term begotten. This kind of throws people. They think only begotten means Christ came into existence. Begotten here comes from monogenes, meaning unique. If I was writing my own version, that's the way I would render it, the only unique God. So notice Jesus here is declared to be God. And notice it also says that he has explained him. The term for explained him literally is he has exegeted the Father. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Yet Jesus coming in the incarnation was mediated. But the great promise for the people of God, for those who believe in Jesus Christ, one day in your resurrected body, you will see him as he is. That's the great promise in 1 John 3, 2. We shall see him as he is. How exciting is that? And we see this in Revelation 22, 3 through 4, in the eternal states, in the new Jerusalem. Notice the curse has been removed. And John says there will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. God the Father, the Lamb's the Son. There's the Father and Son right there. They will be in it. And his bondservants, here's believers, will serve him. They will see his face. Stop there. What did Moses say on Sinai? No one can see my face and live. But here you see in the glorified state, that's going to be rectified. We shall see his face. We shall see him as, as he is. And his name will be on their foreheads. I want to ask everyone in here, of all the desires that you have in life, a good retirement, maybe a nice place to fish and have vacations, having children that do well in life, but is your greatest goal to see God? Is that your greatest goal? Someone asks you, what do you want to attain in life? I want to see God. How many times do you ever hear anyone say that? What's your greatest goal in life? Is it to hit 350 as a baseball player? Is it to hit 3,000 yards as a running back in a season or whatever? Maybe some of you gals, maybe it's to raise children that are decent. That's, that's all wonderful. But the greatest desire all of us should have is to see God. Let me show you and share with you how you can see God. It's only for believers. And I want to share with you the gospel so that anyone in here can see God in the last day. I always tell people that when you explain the good news of the gospel, it really only makes sense in light of the bad news. The bad news is the Bible reveals that every single person has rebelled against the creator of the universe. And our sin 
separates us from Him. That's why it says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. This death isn't just a physical death, but one day it's going to be an eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Yes, Jesus warned about the lake of fire, that those who reject Him will one day perish. I can't think of any worse news. But it's in light of that bad news that the good news of the gospel shines. The good news is that God had a plan from the beginning to send forth His Son, the Son who existed as God and with God from all eternity, at a point in time in history, humbled Himself and became a man through a virgin birth. Why did He become a man? He became a man so that He could live the perfect life that none of us could, so that by trusting in Him, His righteousness could be clothed to us. But Jesus didn't come just to live the perfect life. He also came to die on the cross, a substitutionary death. What does it mean that he's a substitute? Jesus, the perfect one, died to take the debt that we deserve to be punished with, we being the imperfect ones. And he did that in order that we'd have forgiveness of sins. This Jesus died on the cross to take the full measure of God's wrath on behalf of his people. The proof that he accomplished this was seen by the fact that on the third day after his death, he was bodily raised from the dead. He was seen by over 500 eyewitnesses at one time. He then ascended bodily into the heavens where he's seated at the right hand of God from where he's coming again to bring a glorious kingdom, salvation for his people, but judgment upon his enemies. What must we do? Well, Jesus doesn't give just a helpful hint. He gives a command that we have to repent and believe the gospel. Repentance has to do with turning from idolatry uh, idolatry is any God that you've made in your own mind apart from the God of the Bible. Turn from that and turn to God on His terms. His terms is that you would trust in Jesus Christ alone, that He alone has paid your debt, He alone is your righteousness, He alone is your salvation. Today is the day. Trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And the promise from Scripture is that you'll see God. You'll be connected to the non-contingent God who has a saity. That's who we serve. That's who we should honor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your, your essence, who you are, that you are eternal, powerful to save, that you're a God who is transcendent yet imminent. You haven't rejected us. We thank you, Lord, for sending your Son, that through him we can have forgiveness of sins, we can have the promise of everlasting life, we can have the promise of seeing you face to face. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand, if you will, for the benediction. This is from Jude 24 and 25. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week.